The story of Charles Manson. It's a lot of things. It's fascinating, it's disturbing, but most of all, it's outright odd. Odd that such a strange man could amass a following of a hundred plus people to do whatever he wanted. What did he do to these people, or how is this even possible? And it's especially odd when you watch how he talks. I mean, to me, he looks like a psychopath. You know, if I wanted to kill somebody, I'd take this book and beat you to death with it, and I wouldn't feel a thing. It'd be just like walking to the drugstore. But yet you want to come and say, you feel blame? Are you mad? Uh, do you feel like Wolf Bob Rutland? Get fresh. Yeah, Why don't you blame the little babies? But then you look at the comments, and every single one is praising his intelligence. So what is Manson doing to spark this reaction, to draw people in to listen to his words? Well, before we can get into what exactly he's doing, we have to start earlier. We have to start here. Charles Manson has been booked at Terminal Island Prison and is looking to change his ways, not by staying away from crime, but by upgrading his level of crime. All his life, he's been bullied. As a child, he was a social outcast. As a young adult, he earned no respect as he was pushed from one job to the next. He had to make his money by stealing and reselling cars, and he's had enough. He wants to move on to something more powerful. He wants to learn how to command respect. First, he looks to others within Terminal Island for ways to improve his social skills, but nothing really sticks with Manson. Then, he discovers another teacher. Hello, everybody. You know the happiness you get out of life, and to a large extent, the size of your income will depend very largely upon your ability to win friends and influence people. Dale Carnegie was a salesman that ventured away from sales and into self-help instruction, originally targeting businessmen and their ability to speak publicly and communicate better with others. But in 1936, Carnegie released How to Win Friends and Influence People, which was aimed at a general audience instead. It became a massive bestseller, spreading to audiences across the nation. The book extended its reach all the way to classes in certain prisons through the form of a Dale Carnegie course. One of those prisons, as you might guess, was Terminal Island. This was just what Manson was looking for, and for the first time in his life, Manson was an outstanding pupil. Manson studied every detail of the course and wrote notes on how he could better communicate and manipulate those around him. Once he got out, he immediately put his Carnegie training to work in pimping. He smiled more, he remembered the girls' names and used them a lot. He acted interested in conversation with the girls and he made them feel important. He made them feel like they were part of his plan to build up his pimping business. Most potential prostitutes had terrible self-images, so this worked quite well for Manson. Fast forward a few years, and to no one's surprise, Manson has been caught and returns to jail. But again, he looks to self-help and reflection as a guide for his future. He comes up with a new plan that is going to require a lot more manipulation. It's been a hard day's night, and I've been working like a dog. It's 1965, and the music of the Beatles is spreading across the world like a wildfire. Manson doesn't know much about the outside world, but he does know about the Beatles, and he becomes obsessed with their music, and makes the rash decision that when he gets out, he's going to be just as big as them. And he has three steps to do exactly that. One, get out of jail as quickly as possible. Two, find people that he could manipulate, people he could take money from, build connections through, and basically force to do whatever he wants. And three, find a music producer and become famous. Now getting out of jail quickly wasn't the easiest task if you didn't have self-control. Guards would constantly annoy the inmate with the hopes that they would speak back, they'd lash out in some way, and then the guard could file a complaint. Complaints usually meant that the sentencing was either extended or barred from shortening. So Manson recalled the advice of Carnegie for dealing with altercations. I've come to the conclusion that there's only one way under a high heaven to get the best of an argument, and that is to avoid it. Instead of falling for the guard's trap, Manson would let all arguments go. They would say things like, you'll never get out of here, you know, trying to hassle him for no reason at all. And instead of snapping back or acting intimidated, Manson paused, replied, get out of where, man, and continued playing the guitar. The guards couldn't say anything. Manson quickly learned that our first natural instinct in a disagreeable situation is to be defensive, yet this very well may be us at our worst and not our best. Sure enough, Manson was out earlier than expected and could move on to his next part of the plan. Use people for your own benefit. He could no longer use pimping as a source of income since he now lived in Haight-Ashbury in 1966, basically the nation's center for hippie culture. Sex was not really a commodity that people were willing to pay for with the whole free love movement going on. So Manson had to find something else. Of course, Manson turned to manipulation. And this crowd was primed for it. 
Hippies were the misfits that banded together, beatniks that came from around the country to experience a new age of thought, one that rejected the establishment and planned on changing the world with peace, love, and positivity. So everyone was looking for the latest ideas in this progressive form of thinking. A leader they could dedicate their time and money to and in turn receive direct guidance from them. This guru business was thriving, hundreds of people on the street touting self-realized relevations, hoping to attract anyone who listened and agreed. Manson had found his outlet. He couldn't help but stroke his ego and it was a perfect way to put his self-help to even more practice. This time, however, he introduced a new teacher. Along with Carnegie, Manson began to incorporate a much more questionable self-help author, L. Ron Hubbard. Hubbard was the founder of the Church of Scientology and introduced a concept called Dianetics in his 1956 book, Dianetics. The book claims it will help you become free of old fears and restraints by moving towards a theta state where the mind is able to embrace a spiritual freedom. It basically makes a lot of baseless claims about your mind and its connection to the world, but the scientific proof didn't matter to Manson. It had statements like, you are an immortal spiritual being stretching across many lifetimes. Diction that was perfect perfect for a mysterious guru of hate in the 1960s. And as he had with Dale Carnegie, Manson passionately adopted the aspects of Hubbard's teaching that lent themselves to manipulating others. Yet he still needed more to stand out. His content was not radically different from the hundreds of other would-be hate gurus with the exception of his presentation. He again referenced Carnegie's training for when you want to demand attention. Merely stating a truth isn't enough. The truth has to be made vivid, interesting, dramatic. You have to use showmanship. Manson was a masterful orator. He would let his voice fall so the listener had to lean in to continue hearing the story, and at exciting moments he would roar back in volume so the listener couldn't help but feel intrigued in the story. He would build a rhythm of speech while smiling and gesturing broadly. He entertained and he enlightened. He would go on to continuously craft his stories and teachings like this so that he drew in curious listeners wherever he went. Granted, that doesn't answer how he was able to manipulate others into doing whatever he wanted. For that, we can finally talk about the Carnegie concept that Manson was particularly obsessed with, how to get cooperation. No one likes to feel he or she is being sold something or told to do a thing. We much prefer to feel that we're buying of our own accord or acting on our own ideas. And the main point of this section in Carnegie's teaching is to let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. Phil Kaufman spent a lot of time with Manson and affirmed this exact point. He's quoted, that was Charlie's big trick. He'd decide what he wanted someone to do and then talk about it so the girl or whoever would think it was her idea. I saw it all the time. I mean, it was constant. It was where he got his power over people. Manson wasn't a bold, intimidating leader, but rather a soft-spoken seducer. If he really was obsessed with this tactic, you can imagine him slowly and carefully prodding people to get them to the right conclusion. Once they arrived, he exploded in enthusiasm and praised them for their great idea. He abused what's known as the IKEA effect. Modern day research points out how tightly we cling to things that we consider ours. The feeling of ownership skews our perception of value, sometimes by a factor of two times. So by encouraging his followers to come to conclusions that he desired on their own, Manson was abusing one of the most powerful cognitive glitches of the human mind. He slowly converted each one of his followers to his worldview and built a following dedicated to carrying out his plan. After all, they believed these conclusions were their own, so they naturally followed them all the more resolutely, even if that meant murdering people along the way. That's all I'm going to cover from the Manson story because from this point forward, he kind of stems away from the self-help and the tactics that I can flip and hope that you use in a positive light, which was kind of the point of this video, right? I want to present to you the ways of better communicating and influencing those around you so that both parties in your life benefit. And I hope that I've done that. If you enjoyed this video, it'd be great if you could like and comment below. If you'd like to see a similar video I made on how Jeffrey Epstein also manipulated those around him, you can check that out right here. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.